termómetro global por la recuperación de los mundiales de la empresa 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 of intersectional organizing, uh, what are the voices of black indigenous uh, people of color on climate. So as we know, uh, as the world recover, we must think and redefine, uh, analyze how our struggles link all together. Because to face this crisis in the urgency and proportion that it needs uh, to be faced, we need everyone and at the same time. And, that's, and now, this is the urgency of these uh, struggles and uh, the necessity to unite. So we want to combine effort and ensure that no one is, is left behind as we work on this uh, fundamental program uh, to rebuild better and recover from the pandemic uh, that has affected our communities, our movement. At the same time, we've got resilient strength uh, to recover from it. So my first question, is going to, um, uh, to you, Penny. So I'd like to hear from you. What do you think we need to recover? Or is that movement? What do we really need uh, to recover from uh, the work ahead? And we can also pass into the next when you, you're done with the first question. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Landry. Um, well, I, I think as Indigenous people, it, it's not just the pandemic that we have to recover from. It's mm -hmm. You know, for here in the United States, it's over 500 years of colonialism that has uh, brutalized our people. They, like many places, tried to commit genocide against us and did horrendous things to our children and grandchildren in boarding schools for generations. And so um, for us, and I, and I can't really speak for all Indigenous people in the United States, but just based on you know, my friends and the people that I know and the people that I associate with, we, we understand that, that this pandemic is, is still another part of colonization. And we continue to come together and provide mutual aid for each other. Here in the United States, uh, the Native American population has been hit the hardest uh, out of all of the other uh, you know, ethnic groups. And I doubt that there's any one of us that hasn't had a family member or a beloved community member pass away during this time. And I think especially for people of color and, uh, you know, indigenous people, we have a lot of us still our original instructions and our original instructions were way before colonization. And at one time we believed that all humanity on mother earth's belly uh, abided by their original instructions of how to live in balance and harmony and reciprocity with everything around them. And we understand that we are not above any life form on mother earth's belly. And we're one of the newest life forms on her belly. And so, you know, we come to, uh, to doing this work with a type of humility and understanding that we are nature protecting herself as my mentor and beloved friend Casey Camp Hornick says. Um, we're, we're not separate from anything. And I think as people of color and indigenous people around the world, that's, that's where our power lies right now. We have a lot to share with the people who forgot how to be a proper human being. For, for many, many years, hundreds and hundreds of years. So here we are with this capitalist system of individualism and personal greed and not caring for one another. And it's up to us, I think, to help remind the rest of the people in the world who have forgotten those things. And that's a very powerful, powerful place for us to stand on. Um, in my opinion, speaking from um, a global South and a youth perspective, I feel that we haven't reached the point of recovery. Um, we are facing 
um, significant um, other socioeconomic problems, gender-based violence, um, poverty, um, harm, gangsterism. So for me to say that um, a way that we can recover or something that we need to kind of recover from, I feel like we have not reached that point. Um, that's why I still believe that awareness and fighting for what we believe is correct is still a big part of youth advocacy here in South Africa and youth all over the world. So in order for us to reach a point of recovery, we have to face what we're facing right now and still lobby for advocacy, for awareness, and for people to actually stand up and understand what's happening in their environments and in their communities in order for them to be able to equip themselves with the necessary resources for them to stand up and um, fight these, in, like, these injustices. Um, and COVID-19 has definitely made it way harder. So for me personally, I feel like we have not reached the point of recovery. We can't say definitively what we need to recover because we are still in the midst of fighting all of these socioeconomic injustices that we face. Thank you, Ayaka, and thank you also, Ben. It's really, again, I think it's really an honor to be to be here and then talk, you know, and then share. I I, I heard what Ben was saying, and then I actually took a number of uh, points that I think. I share a similar opinion, uh, similar views with Penny, but also what Ayaka was saying. I really want to emphasize that, like one of the points that I feel really, really important to be highlighted is that we are not recovering just yet. Um, I don't know how far we are from there, but for me, what I believe in, in the work that we are doing in, 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 in indigenous movements in the Asia and the Pacific, in, in, in in feminist movements in the Asia and the Pacific, we feel that we keep on struggling, we still keep on dismantling the system that is actually being exposed. The value is actually being exposed. The value of capitalism, the value of neoliberal economic system is being exposed by the pandemic. The multidimensional crisis that was, it, it has been there before, the climate crisis, and the, 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 the crisis in so many indigenous communities all over the world, the crisis that being faced by marginalized women in many corners of the world. And then here comes the pandemic. But also, you know, one thing that really need to be, to be emphasized that the, the, the crisis that, that, that we are facing during the pandemic the increasing inequality is actually not a coincidence. It really is just exposing what has been there and then what needs to be really done to, to, to how you call that, to actually make it, make it better. I think um, another thing that I, I, I take note here is um, how we see what we need to recover from, from is actually the, the culture or of over consumption and production that is really one of a major cause of climate crisis. And then now a lot of us, a lot of people, basically a lot of governments, um, us as in the world, um, talking about recovering from climate crisis. But what I think in, in, in feminist movements, what we are afraid of is it is actually greening capitalism. So in terms of what we need to recover um, in Accra, Ghana, if you like, it's one that we need to first recognize that there's a challenge that we are dealing with. We need to appreciate the gravity of the issue confronting us. And once we, we recognize that, at least we know that of a truth, we, are, we have an issue at stake. Um, or, you know, I have mentioned that we are not there yet. Um, you know, which which is quite true, uh, but you know, I want to pick it from stages because um, people are already suffering. People have already been affected. People have lost livelihood. They've lost jobs. You know, they are not even too sure what to do with their life. For, for, so for such people, they want to see how do they get out of that situation. So I'm speaking from that particular context. So one is about admitting that indeed um, farmers are losing their crops. Uh, young people are going to take loans, you know, to start farming business. Now, you know, they can't even predict the rainfall patterns. When it rains, the rain washes away their farm produce or their farm and, you know, their business collapses. So we have all these issues you know, confronting young people. So how do they recover? So one 
we must admit that climate change is happening, that we have a serious pandemic, um, COVID-19 confronting us. So that's the first point we need, you know, to, to start with. And then secondly, also it's about uh, the resources uh, that we need to recover. Uh, need to only financial resources, but uh, we also have human resources. Um, fortunately, even though young people can also be vulnerable to some of this impact of climate change, they can at the same time be resources that can be used to address the increasing impact of climate change. So yes, we have the youth power, we have the, they have the numbers, they have the skills, they have the abilities, so we can still harness the skills of young people in a recovery you know, from this climate impact or, and then from the pandemic. And the, the last thing I also believe we need has to do with the issue of determination. Um, once we, are, we need to be determined, we need to be committed, we need to put in place you know, all the measures uh, because it is one thing to admit that there's a problem. It is one thing to say that let's find a solution. But usually it ends up on paper. It becomes just word of mouth. But we must show determ determination by putting in place all the necessary resources, the energy we need to ensure that we recover properly from this impact that is you know, confronting, uh, if you like, young people in Accra and Ghana. So from my point of view, I think these are the three key things we need you know, as part of recovering from the crisis confronting us at the moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for that uh, first uh, uh, round of sharing on the needs. Uh, allow me to come back to, to you, uh, Ayaka and Patricia, because you said somehow in your answers, we are not yet there. Or oh, it's not just about uh, the pandemic. There are other crises, inequalities, and uh, severe injustice that need to be exposed and that we need to cover from, to recover from, sorry. And then maybe just quick one to, to, to uh, the two of you, uh, what are the two key things that you think from where you're sitting have to be in place for a just recovery to happen? Um, so last year, um, during the State of the Nation address, um, I articulated to our president that there are um, climate change is something that needs to be factored into the agenda, but not, not only be factored in, but taken as a top priority. Um, and then he finally listened to us by um, making um, a commission called the Presidential Coordinating Committee on Climate Change, where we are focusing on making a just transition possible and making it flow as smoothly as possible um, by 2050. Um, so I feel like our president taking that into our Count and listening to our grievances, we are one step closer to actually making our goal true um, for a, the just transition. Because as South Africa, we are highly reliant on coal. And it was um, in very devastating to read that we are still moving forward with oil and gas. Um, so by the president establishing this commission, it is one step forward for us, making sure that we as a country are moving towards a more renewable and safe route. Um, so I feel like that is one of the most important things that I'm doing in my context. So raising youth awareness in that, creating um, policies and making sure that youth a part of those discussions is a big step that we're taking as a country to make sure that we are joining the world in trying to move to a greener econo economy and moving to a more greener and sustainable future for generations to come. Two key things that has to be that have to be in place, I guess, uh, first of all, we don't need false solutions. That is something that really needs to be in place because we are talking about climate ambitions, but we as the people should not be distracted by that. Ambitious, like all these ambitious commitments to climate crisis shouldn't, shouldn't be the smoke screen and we should not be distracted. What does it mean? It means when people, so many countries are talking about public private partnerships, for building back better. What does it mean? We really need to know, does it mean that really to recover from climate crisis or does it mean to still put the profit on the, in the hands of the few business as usual? We should not be distracted by net zero emissions commitment. What does it mean? Does it mean still again, having you know, the corporation still hold the profits while at the same time getting the green label you know, all those kind of things. So that's, I think, first thing that we as the people should be really, really strong about, like what are the agendas behind so many things. We need to be critical and there shouldn't be all these false, false solutions. That's what we have to keep on, keep on fighting on. And I guess like another thing that we need to also 
think about that maybe have to be in place is that we are not just exposing the issues or we are not just speaking and amplifying the voices of the peoples on the ground of our communities, but we also uh, we also offer solutions. And for APWLD, we are very strong and very clear. Our members across the Asia and the Pacific regions have been talking a lot about development justice. What does it mean development justice? Development justice means we have to have a radical shift on the current global economy system. The trade and investment agreement that actually, that actually um, enable corporations to sue the countries for protecting their peoples, protecting their environment. You know, so I think I will stop there. Those are the two big things that we feel as APWLD and myself also believe in that have to be in place if we want to really recover. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you both uh, for articulating the key points uh, that have to be part of what we consider being a just recovery for all. And also building on that, because uh, Patricia, you mentioned uh, the false solution, the net zero narrative being now kind of widespread. Uh, do you think, and that would be maybe a question for uh, Chiveze and, and, and Penny, is there a risk? Is there a risk for the world to recover unjustly? We've seen some countries starting these uh, vaccine rod programs. Uh, some of them have already, are already accessing and uh, um, um, have started such program, but others, we know it is a struggle, even accessing and uh, preventing uh, the, 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 the pandemic for the majority of people. So is there a risk for the world uh, to recover uh, unjustly? Absolutely. I think it's a huge risk. And it's what the pattern has been for hundreds of years. Um, and uh, Part of the work that I do with movement rights, movement rights helps tribes and communities align human laws with natural laws. And around the world, this has been happening. Um, India, New Zealand, United States, Canada, different parts of the world. I, I don't know if it's happened. I don't know of any situations in, in Africa yet, but um, it, one of the things that we have learned is that it takes a lot of on the ground work to shift culture. And I think that that's what we're really talking about here is how do we shift culture in order for people to, to have a true understanding of what's at risk. I mean, even here in the occupied United States, we the majority of people here still don't understand that we're as hum, humanity and the sacred system of life is having a, a, an existential crisis right now. And so it's a lot of work on the ground and working within these communities. I am not a top down type of person. Um, I don't I don't work on policy. I never have. I had some horrible experiences of how that whole system is rigged when I was very young in my early 20s. And so my work has always been on the grassroots level, um, locally and nationally and internationally. And I think that, you know, we're we're at this pivotal time where if we can educate enough people on the ground um, as to what net zero is, what these false solutions are, why we don't believe that they're the way forward, how capitalism and corporate law around the world is um, driving the fossil fuel industry and chemical industries to destroy our health and our environments. I mean, it's a, it's a lot for people to, to share and understand. But I think that that's one of the most powerful ways forward, at least for me and, and a lot of the people that I know. Thank you. Um, I also perfectly do believe that uh, we stand at a great risk if we recover unjustly, um, given the fact that you know people are affected differently um, by the impact of climate change or by the pandemic. So we cannot use one fit all approach to address you know, the challenges or what people are being confronted with. So we, we, need, to, we need to have that clearly um, established. The other thing is that um, here we are you know, in the current global development agenda, 
we are talking about leaving no one behind. We are talking about issues of equality or addressing inequality. We are talking about issues of equity. So if we have agreed on those principles, then what it means is that in the same vein, if we make any effort to recover, then we must not leave anyone behind. We must not leave people more impoverished. We must not leave people in, in, a, more, in, a, in a worse case than they find themselves now. So we need to apply the solutions, we need to apply the, the remedies you know, in a just manner. Uh, so nobody feels uh, deprived, nobody feels rejected, nobody feels uh, uh, disengaged or, or marginalized. So for me, that is that is quite, otherwise we will we'll proceed putting much investment and realize that we have actually left a lot of people behind and we've actually left them in a worse situation than they find themselves in now. So as far as I'm concerned, if we do not consciously ensure that we recover justly, they are going to create more risk and you know we're going to rather leave people in a more severe situation than they find themselves in now. Thank you. And then my next question is going to be. Uh, based on all those um, 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 crises, inequalities, at the same time, we being um, movement builders, being at the forefront of all of this fight, what, are, I mean, what do we have to do? What do we have to do as community leaders, indigenous leaders, uh, activists, campaigners, organizers uh, to recover justly? What are the maybe, it can be something already happening? that you are doing in your communities or you are part of a um, movement organization coalition that are at the moment mobilized for the just recover to, to recovery to happen. So what do we have to do if we want to, uh, to recover justly? Um, what do we need to do? Um, I think, first of all, I have heard um, a statement about how youth has to be at the center how women has to be at the center, how indigenous peoples has to be at the center, the peoples have to be at the center, doesn't matter wherever we're coming from. It is again and again, I think, reemphasize what you're saying, what 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 Chibese was also saying, that it, this is not a, an issue of only, only one sector. And that is where also we are sometimes actually um, how you call that actually trapped on, in, in, in silos. And this is also why it's very important where we strengthen our structure of solidarity, our struct, oh, sorry, our culture of solidarity and our culture of collectivism, you know, like really strengthen the movement and build the movement because we have the, we have, we have this one common struggles. So I guess that's one thing that I feel that we really need to do uh, but also like for APWLD ourselves, what we have been doing because we believe that this struggle is not just now. We keep on recovering for, 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 for decades, for centuries from, I think Penny was mentioning about colonialism and then the legacy that is still there and then the subjugation that being, being experienced by indigenous peoples all over the world. It doesn't matter whether you are in, in North America or, or in, in, in Asia or in the Pacific, like having completely, you know, you are still facing inequality within, within, within even the country. So I think one thing that we, re we really believe in and we have been doing as APWLD is um, uh, putting also um, a women's voice at the center, which means that, so we have this feminist participatory action research. So it is, it is an effort of us, of APWLD together with grassroots women's movement to, for them to speak for, the, for themselves. So for me, sometimes I feel this is not a place for me in all my privilege being here in Chiang Mai to talk about how do we recover for, from this climate crisis, but it is more of them. So that's, that's the spirit that we keep on building and that's the, the spirit that we keep on strengthening and we want to keep on doing that if you want to recover justly. Thank you. Um, I feel like what we need to do to recover justly is that we have to start with recognition. As uh, one of the panelists has said, that we have to recognize how big the issue is. And not only recognition, but how do we move forward from there? I feel like raising awareness, education is still a very fundamental and important part in us actually um, getting more people involved in this movement. Because 
What I often found is that when I try to talk to people about climate change in my community, that shut me down and tell me that's um, a problem for the global north, that's a problem for privileged people, that I don't have time to worry about that. I have to worry if my kids are gonna come home from school safely. Um, they'd be talking about um, whether they have to worry about whether they're gonna put on the table at the end of the day. So in order for us to, um, to recover justly, we have to make sure that the people that are most important and the people that are getting most affected by these issues are the ones that are put at the forefront by using a human-centered approach, putting the person in the middle of these discussions. Um, and I also feel that we have to involve more youth because I do agree that the older you are, the more experience you have, but then we don't need experience at the point that we are because this is uncharted territory and we really don't know how this can go. Um, and I feel like if we bring younger voices and more innovative voices, we'll find more robust um, people stepping up and giving us innovative solutions that we've never seen before that might work um, very, very well. Um, so for me, I feel like that's what we need to do to recover justly is still um, raise more awareness because the recognition is important, but also incorporate more youth voices into um, the, 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 the just transition and also these big discussions so that we can hear their innovative solutions because we are fresh, we are the voices of today, and we know um, how we want our future to look like when um, the older generation is no, not here any longer. Um, so for me, I feel like those are the two important points and I'll pass it on to Ms. Penny. In North America, the climate movement is, the, the front edge of the climate movement is, uh, is led by indigenous women on the ground who are fighting, again, resisting pipelines all over Canada and the United States. And um, a lot of them are very young women. And if, I believe that, that the youth that are here, like all of you that are here today, um, I'm, I'm gonna get a little spiritual with you because that's the kind of person I am. But uh, in the eighties, I started seeing babies being born that were different from any other babies that I had seen in my entire life. And I have watched them grow up and they um, are you, you know, babies after that. Not all the babies, but a pretty good percentage of the babies that I've witnessed came in with something extra, came in with, a, with more wisdom and with more talent and skill for this time than any babies that I saw before that time. And so I, I agree that the young people have a certain skill set and strength and came into the world um, at this time for a purpose. So I heartily agree that all of you are, are like the tip of the spear of change. And as older people, I feel like our job is to not only listen to you, but provide all the support that we can based on our life experiences. And that's what, um, I have a circle of grandmothers that we've been meeting regularly for uh, over uh, like 15 years or something. And so that's what we do. And, and perhaps that is another way forward is to identify the, the older people in your community who've been doing this work for decades who might be a little tired like I am and some of my friends are, but that we, we still had some wins, you know, just a few. It's been a hard time these last 60 years, I can tell you, but we're seeing some wins now. And I think that that's one of the most important things that we can do is identify any kind of win that we have and celebrate it, even if it's small, because if we don't do that, um, our spirits will be diminished. We will be, get tired on the inside. So I think like mutual support uh, around the world, however that looks, whether it's um, financial support or emotional support, or, I mean, this is really difficult work that we're doing. It's, it's challenging, it's heartbreaking, it's all of those things. But looking to see where you can 
plug in to regenerate yourselves is a very important thing. And I can't tell you the number of times that I have been asked by groups over decades after they've already organized what they're gonna do, they come to indigenous people and say, oh yeah, would you come and lead us in a prayer or would you come and talk about this specific thing? And when I was in my thirties, I realized that that's, that's not where I wanna be. I, we are not an add-on. We are not going to come into whatever you're doing after you've already set the table and laid it and started serving the food like that is not what we're going to do and that's how i started speaking to these people and i encourage you to do the same thing if they want us at the table they need to invite us to help build that table and it's you know it's it's all the emotions that come with challenging those kinds of situations we just all need to get over that we need to make sure that we are at every single table that is important for our people and be courageous enough to say that, that you can't come and ask us after you've set the table and served the food. So I think that those, I mean, they might sound really simple things, but we're all in this for the long haul. And those are things that I have learned myself. Thank you. Well, um, th thank you very much for all those uh, wonderful submissions. So the, the little bit I'll ask, uh, sorry, I'll add on has to do in terms of uh, how do we take responsibility is, um, um, let, let me start by using a familiar phrase or say, uh, we have a familiar saying, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a popular saying that you cannot teach an old dog new tricks, you know, so um, it, it is a lot of work to change. So what that means in essence is that the polluters, you know, the, those men, the fossil fuel industry, the businessmen, you know, they have been in the business for years. So it is quite difficult to change their mindset. Um, the, the last thing you want to tell a businessman is, is to take action that will uh, reduce his profit margin and cannot guarantee that he's going to make more money uh, from your from your proposal. So so it is it's quite difficult to engage them. So that is why for us, we believe that they will need to shift more attention to the younger generation who are beginning to start their own businesses, who have new ideas, who have new ambition, and then try to carry them along that whatever ambition they have must move towards our common agenda in ensuring green economy, uh, the kind of future we want, the kind of what we want. So it's about taking that responsibility on ourselves as young people. And that's what we are doing uh, here in Ghana, that young people taking up their own responsibility and engaging policymakers and decision makers. The, the other thing that we has, I think that we've also done played is about the kind of energy and power or potency that young people have. I mean, globally, if wherever there's chaos, wherever there's war, wherever there's confusion, you find young people leading the process. You don't find old women or old men. They're the ones carrying the guns. They're the ones you know, causing chaos and, and mayhem. So it means that they have the energy. They have that power. They have that force. But the question is, how are we directing those force? So it's like a water, you know, uh, uh, an amount of water. Water can be both destructive and can also be beneficial, depending on how you use or how the water, the force of the water is applied. So we think that if these young people have this power or this energy, instead of allowing them to use them negatively or use people manipulating that energy for their selfish aggrandizement, why don't we harness those energy and power for a good cause, if for nothing at all, for the sake of their own future. At least every young person wants to live long. Every young person wants to be very profitable. Every young person wants to live a good life. Every young person wants to breathe good air. Every young person wants to live a nice life. So if you can provide those alternatives to them, I'm sure that, I mean, they will buy into that, into that idea. So that, and that ties into the awareness creation and empower young people, bring them on board. And I think it's our responsibility, you know, and we don't want to depend on government to take that responsibility. As young people, we have taken our own cross and we are moving and say, look, this is the future we want. And in doing that, we have, at the moment, we are currently developing a youth strategy for climate action in Ghana. So what we are saying that, well, government you may have your own policy, you have your own plan, you have your own strategy. But for the first time, young people are saying, when it comes to climate change, these are our concerns and this is how we want to be engaged in the fight against climate change after all it's about our future so 
we are taking that responsibility. And I think that uh, as young people, uh, we have to take their fight, you know, take it, not because we are aggressive, but we want to bring to offer our skills, our innovativeness, our creativity, you know, as part of the climate solutions in, 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 the, in the world. So I think that that's the kind of, if you like, um, the, the, the responsibility that we have taken upon ourselves as young people in Ghana. So just sharing um, our experience in Ghana. Thank you. As we approach the, uh, unfortunately, the end of our very uh, interesting uh, conversation, I just want to uh, kind of try to end with a commitment from you all. We're going to do another go around, uh, starting with one of you, passing to another. What are we committing to do? What are we kind of commitment are we going to make this year, in this period, in this project for ourselves, you know, for Mother Earth? and for the wider social justice uh, movement, what kind of commitment, one or two, are we making for ourselves, for the wider social justice movement and for Mother Earth? Well, since I've been doing this work for over 40 years, I'm just, I can say that I will definitely be continuing this work. And um, a lot of work around the rights of Mother Earth, the rights of nature, which I, I do encourage you all to take a look at. We have some great um, videos at movementrights.org. And also I'm, I commit to continuing to uh, provide support to young activists, young people, part of the movement, including all of you. If you, you know, ever need a grandma to talk to or an auntie, just uh, get a hold of me, I'm pretty easy to find. And uh, I think that, that just me continuing to put one foot in front of the other and listen to uh, what my spirit is telling me to do is what I will continue to do until the day I die. So hopefully that's a little bit in the future. <laughs> it's very personal and then kind of like, okay. Um, but again, in thinking about commitments, I think if Benny has been actually fighting for over 40 years, I feel like it doesn't matter whether it's day one for me to fight, I'll continue. <laughs> um, continue continue to imagine a radical future, a radical change in all this chaos, a radical, radical change for a better future. And, and I think while continuing doing that with that commitment, I, I, I think me personally would want to also thank the elders, our elders who have actually hold the torch and now they pass they pass the torch to us and then what we are doing now is exactly what our elders our 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 those who are there before us actually doing also before you know we are also holding the torch and we will pass this one day to the future generation we are also building a mountain of movement so that our future generations can actually see even clearer. For me, the, the, the privilege that I'm having here, the honor that I'm having here right now, will be able to talk to you all, a small girl coming from the eastern part of Indonesia, far away, third, fourth world country within the country itself is a result of a, a mountain that being built through collective movements that have been, you know, like fighting for the collective rights, our, what, our, our collective struggles. So, so for me, there is no reason to stop the fight, but more reason with all the distraction, it is just more reason to keep on strengthen the commitment to continue fighting. Thank you. Um, yeah, for me, I've made a couple of commitments this year. Um, I'm just going to start with my personal commitment. Um, I've committed um, this whole year to actually advocate, do campaigns and raise awareness around climate change in my community. So I've put off a um, university for this year so I can solely focus on how I can make an impactful change in my community and make sure that the most marginalized voices are put at the forefront and they are heard because I don't like being called the voice of the youth or like the voice of the movement, because I believe that each person has their own individual story to tell and I'm not the person to tell that story. So for me, it's not about me talking for other people, it's elevating and giving people a stage for them to talk for themselves. 
Um, so that is my personal commitment for this year, um, but also my commitment as an overall to Mother Earth and to um, this big sphere of the movement is to make sure that as I'm part of the pres presidential coordinating committee on climate change is that we do involve the voice of the grassroots level, the voice of the people that are getting most affected at the tables of policy making and trying to make people understand what each policy means and trying to make people um, engage with these policy and stakeholders so that they know exactly what's happening in their country. So for me, it's all about strengthening the bond between our social groups and also strengthening the bond and trying to make people understand how interlinked all of our struggles are and that we should truly stand in solidarity with each other so that we can make um, more noise and create tangible change that um, our future generations can see and say that I'm here right now because uh, my grandfather, my mother did this for me. Um, so my commitment is to make sure that I continue in the fight and not give up. I will not give up. Like <laughs> um, Aunt Penny has said here that she's been fighting for 40 years and then she's still continuing on the fight. And I feel like that's something that I want to do as well to make sure that we truly leave, leave this earth um, in a much better condition for future generations to come. So that is my commitment to never stop in this battle and make sure that intersex intersectionality is encouraged in our communities so that the marginalized communities know exactly what's happening in their country or in the world so that they can also put their voices forward and make a change or be part of the change. Um, so I also want to pick it at a personal level and then to share what my, my group will also commit to. Um, so personally, um, um, thankfully, I, I, I do get the opportunity to participate in national dialogues or national decision-making process on climate change. Um, we are currently developing our national adaptation plan through the support of GCF. And then also we are currently reviewing our nationally determined contributions, you know, as part of the Paris Climate uh, Agreement requirement. And uh, I just got an invitation uh, now that next week there's a, so we, we are reviewing the NDCs and all the sectors have, have submitted their action plan. So there's a meeting to review the action plan, where their comments, where their concerns, CSOs or NGOs can make, you know, their, their concerns you know, known to the government. So at a personal level, when I, once I go for those meetings, I, I will ensure or I will, you know, just add a voice to that, at least the, particularly people living in, in communities are not adversely affected by some of these, you know, uh, action plans. Because sometimes what I realize is that there may be some good action plan, but sometimes they come with some unintended consequences. You know, the idea may be good, but eventually it ends up affecting the women, people in the community and other. So somebody has to actually uh, be very, very, you know, must track the process and make sure that people are not affected, you know, adversely by good uh, projects, quote unquote. So at the personal level, I will, I, will, I will keep an eye on that and ensure that at least people are not affected adversely by the, our climate change interventions. As a group, um, um, well, I, I have engaged my, my team members to, to begin a process. What we intend to do moving forward uh, this year in a couple of months is to start a monthly youth-led webinar on climate change. So what we intend to do is that we want to identify all young climate activists across the world, uh, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in Southern America, etc., to create a platform for learning and sharing and cross-pollination of ideas. Um, that is for us one way that we can build a stronger movement so that when the young people in Africa get to know what is happening in Europe, in Asia, to give them a better perspective because it's about young people and young people must also appreciate what their colleagues are doing in other countries some are actually being uh, marginalized some are actually under threat some some are even having their lives you know in danger what can we do in our own small way to support our colleagues in those difficult countries so that is our commitment that we want to come together bring more young people together to fight this common agenda so of course, we're having people like Ayaka and Patricia to come and share their experience, to motivate even the, the young girl in Accra that, oh, if a young lady in, in you know, um, forgive me, Patricia, I don't remember your country anymore, but if a young lady in South Africa or any part of the world is doing so much, they mean that I can also do that. So that becomes a motivation to grow more young people into this movement. So those are, for me, the two key commitments we're making this year uh, in this uh, agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much, all. Thank you, Penny. 
thank you Chibeze, thank you Ayaka, thank you Patricia for such a, you know, important, amazing contribution uh, as we go through this uh, uh, gathering, Global Just Recovery gathering and sharing your perspective, your rich experience, your wisdom with uh, all uh, the, the, the participants at this program. This is extremely powerful. I want to thank you so much uh, for your time. And uh, as uh, someone beautifully said, whether you are one old, um, one year old um, activist or 40 years old, this is, there are so many reasons uh, to keep fighting because we know colonialism is still happening in different forms, extractivism, gender violence, domestic violence, uh, fight to access the basics, water, food, electricity. These are the issues that, you know, collectively in our communities or, you know, across, across the globe we are facing. So there are many reasons to fight. And if we are at the center and if we work with our, our community representative and our leaders and the uh, ordinary people that we serve, that we lead, that trust us to be at the center of such processes and fights and campaigns, Together we will win the fight. Global Just Recovery Gathering.